What's up, freaks? It's your boy Marty Bent here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. I sat down with Corey Clipston from Swan Bitcoin, CEO and founder of Swan Bitcoin, to talk about uh, a bunch of things, including how Swan Bitcoin came to be, how they're helping Bitcoiners DCA into Bitcoin and use uh, use Bitcoin as a savings vehicle, how they're educating Bitcoiners, uh, and on top of that, a bunch of other things, including uh, Corey's journey to Bitcoin, why he thinks it's so important. Uh, Bitcoin or ventures and and some other topics. I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. This episode of Tales from the Crypt is brought to you by our good friends at the Cash App. You freaks already know all about them. All right, they're helping you do many things. They're becoming a new old bank, uh, you can do a lot with the Cash App, including stack sats. You can stack sats, send sats, receive sats, uh, sell sats if you so please. Uh, you don't have to, but the ability is there. On top of that, they're helping you stack slivers of stonks. Uh, on top of stacking sats, you can stack slivers of stonks via Cash App Investing. If your favorite stonk, if you invest in stonks, I know some of you don't, but if your favorite stonk is a little too expensive and you are investing in stonks, you can buy as little as $1 on the Cash App. And because the Cash App is connected directly to your bank account or because it is your bank account, you can get an account number and a routing number now and you can get your paychecks directly deposited into the Cash App makes it a lot easier to stack sats. It takes out a whole step in doing that. You get your uh, yeah, your your work check deposited into the Cash App, and you can start stacking sats with that right away. And you can even set up a DCA function. We do it once a week, uh, once a day, once a month. You can set that up in the Cash App. Now, they just released that. And st- sats are the standard. You can make sats a standard within the app. I've been doing that recently. It's really cool to see how, how many sats you stack over Bitcoin. Um, if you're stacking stonks, know that Cash App Investing is a subsidiary of uh, Square and is a member SIPC. As always, use the code stacking sats. That's S T A C K I N G S A T S when you download the app. You're going to get $10. And $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. Owl, 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 Owls Lacrosse. Woo, woo, not that dirtbag owl. Don't get it confused. Hope you guys are enjoying your Memorial Day. If you're in the States, if you're not in the States, I just hope you're enjoying your Monday. Peace and love, freaks. Take care. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here on a lovely Friday afternoon. Vibes are high. It's Friday. It's the afternoon. Temperature's rising. Sun's out. And we're here to talk about Bitcoin somebody who's diving headfirst into it and uh, approaching it from many different aspects. I'd like to introduce you freaks to Corey Clipston, CEO of Swan Bitcoin. What's going on, dude? Hey, Marty. Good to be here. And uh, yeah, is, is that a swan dive then? A swan, yeah. Swan dive right in. <laughs> okay. I see what I see what you yeah, did there. Yeah. We're going to have to see if you can do a, a swan call. I haven't actually dialed in on exactly what a swan sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't that's know. actually pretty it's pretty good it's uh um, that's pretty nah. good i don't know swan i just remember geese when i lived in south carolina we were bad kids and we used to mess with the geese uh around the plantation and they would like chase us and get very mad i think that was a geese sound i just made a goose sound mm, mm. sound the geese they, they got to be cousins right but like the goose lays golden eggs and and swans fucking love bitcoins this is true especially the black ones. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So before we dump in uh, everything you guys are doing at Swan, I hope people DCA into Bitcoin and, and look at savings from a different aspect. How the hell did you get into all this? What, what's your backstory? What'd you, what were you doing before Bitcoin? Yeah, sure. So, uh, man, you never know quite where to start there. But, um, you know, I I'd had a long career in, uh, in technology and management consulting. I'd worked for Microsoft and then McKenzie and went to B school at university of Chicago and worked for Google for a while. Basically, I think this is probably the best way to, I think when I look back and try to be objective about it, I think what happened with me is I worked in tech during the dot-com bubble and bust. 
And that made me sort of look for work or just to be involved in a part of the economy that seemed like it was on a more solid foundation. So I went to business school at like the most, you know, hardcore solid one you could find, which is University of Chicago. And I went to McKinsey, which was, you know, like the most hardcore, supposedly solid company you could work for. And I did private equity, which seems like super hardcore <laughs> and solid. And I ended up basically, you know, in the middle of this massive bubble in the supposedly, you know, solid real economy, um, you know, in private equity and in, in 08 just kind of like shut down. And I, I had a consulting firm in uh, in Chicago that I was running at the time post McKinsey. And, uh, you know, just kind of watching all this stuff go on with the subprime and, and the whole global financial crisis. And I was looking around and I was like, damn, this, uh, doesn't seem so solid either. What is going on here? So that was kind of, you know, priming me to, to always be on the lookout for something. And, you know, the, the genesis of me getting into the startup world, which I've been in for a long time now, was just wanting to have more control over my own life and have more control over my own outcomes. Um, just kind of like bet on yourself. Uh, I, as you guys can probably tell from the title or the name of the company, I've been a massive Taleb fan going back to 2002. So I'm about 18 years now of sort of reading everything the guy writes, usually 10 to 15 times. I've lots of dog-eared copies of his books. And, um, you know, I, uh, it was really his philosophy, like trying to set yourself up to be anti-fragile or just like robust to change. And if you, if you run something yourself and you have a lot of clients and aren't dependent on just one, um, that's basically where you set yourself up for success. So, you know, I think another, another good influence on, on me and how we run our company was the 37 signals guys, mm -hmm. the guys that, uh, put out signal versus noise and rework and all of that. Um, our author, uh, Matt Ruby, who writes a lot of stuff for us, including, uh, one of our books and a lot of our blog posts and stuff was their ghost author and wrote two of their New York times bestselling books and been friends with him actually for the same 18 years. So I met, I met Matt and, uh, the, the work of Taleb the same year. So that's pretty cool. Um, so I wanted to get into startups. I, uh, I couldn't really figure out how to get from like management consulting into early stage startups because everyone wants to pigeonhole you into like working for, for some late stage, heavily venture funded, and then give you kind of a straight jacket role as like strategy guy or something like that. It was just super boring. It's more of the same. I wanted to build things and make mistakes and, you know, have your ideas be meaningful and, you know, change the trajectory by 50% or hundred percent, not, not 2%. Um, so I, I actually went to Google for a couple of years just to kind of network with VCs and startup founders and really just start my apprenticeship and start learning. So from 2011, I basically started learning how to run startups. I was mentoring in as much as I could add some value, maybe on the marketing side or the strategy side, uh, some local startups in Chicago and then in Los Angeles when I moved out here. And then by summer of 13, I felt comfortable enough that I had a good enough network and like a little bit to add um, value wise to get into the startup ecosystem. Um, so I did, I jumped in, I, I started advising, started cutting some angel checks and, um, and started looking for companies to join and actually operate in. Um, and this is where the, the timing actually dovetails interestingly. So I joined uh, an ad tech startup in uh, December of 13 and uh, raising the first round of capital for that company. Uh, I was running around to conferences and I was at a tech and media conference January 29th of 2014 here in Los Angeles. And, uh, and someone was passing out Bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> saying, install this blockchain wallet and I'll give you $50 in Bitcoin. So I did and uh, proceeded to not go down the rabbit hole not read the white paper and lose the private keys. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely feel the pain of, of people that feel like they've missed it. I absolutely just missed the signal and didn't pick up on it. Thank you for your, for your service, for, for losing that private key, your, uh, your donation to, to the rest of the hodlers is, you know, is well respected. Just, just trying to reduce supply a little bit, you know, like that's the mission, yeah. reduce the supply, L reduce the available supply. Uh, nah, uh, I, um, before we dive into like the Bitcoin stuff, cause I, I'm happy you brought up 37 signals. I was actually, I've had two touch points with that book. They read about the startup culture and running lean and iterating quickly and testing ideas. And I think it's, and again, like coming, I, I'm interested to hear the dichotomy of coming from McKinsey and university of Chicago. And then that sort of education that the 37 signals books provides where it's like, 
just get out there, iterate, 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 and sort of goes against uh, some of those cultures in, in uh, established academia. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because they're not, they're not that dissimilar because, you know, the whole McKenzie thing is being hypothesis driven. So you're supposed to just sort of dive in, do a lot of research and think really hard and come up with what you think is the right answer. And you don't test like 10 things, you test one thing and see if it works. And then you learn and then make the, the next best guess, which is not all that dissimilar from, you know, getting out an MVP that you think is going to have product market fit and then iterating based on user feedback. So I think maybe that's just kind of a smart way of doing things generally. So it's a little bit more about, you know, who are you doing it for? Mm -hmm. You know, I was constantly trying to save dying companies that were doing horrible things around the world. And uh, instead you can build the future. I think startups are more fun. Yeah. And that's another thing that that book really drives home or all the writing is that it's, it's cheaper than ever to, to get these ideas out there and test them and, and then scale up, which is. Yeah. And, and also just like what you learn from being in the game, right? So just by putting out a product and, and putting up, hanging up a shingle and telling the world that you're doing this thing, that's how you get people coming out of the woodwork, wanting to help you and wanting to do things. And, you know, I uh, certainly had that thesis. I was like, if I can just hang up a damn shingle in Bitcoin and say, like, we're doing this in Bitcoin, you'll meet people and you'll have ideas and you'll figure out what the right thing is to do. We can get into that a little bit uh, later, you know, kind of the evolution of, of this company and this project over the last year. Um, but uh, yeah, so let me just quickly finish that story. So, yeah, so I started going hard at startups. I spent the next you know, seven years now uh, in the startup world, I ended up having a, uh, a pretty good spike, I guess you'd say, or just like ended up being pretty good at, at raising money. I've been doing that for a long time anyway. I used to raise money for like nightclubs and restaurants starting 2004. Um, and so I started doing that heavily in the startup world and, and um, you know, basically from leaving the ad tech company in the late 2015, over the next four years, I was in that sort of like strategy and fundraising advisor seat next to an early stage CEO for a little over a quarter billion of fundraising across like 30 something rounds for about 20 companies. So I got good at, you know, writing decks, big network of, you know, VCs and angels and kind of reaching out to people and, and getting them interested in, in what we were doing with these different companies. So that was kind of my training. And that's what I've, you know, I don't, I don't know how to add more to Bitcoin. I'm not going to be a core dev. I'm not going to, not going to understand a lot of things, but one thing I do understand is, you know, bringing people together around uh, a company or a cause and essentially just kind of like throwing a party around anything that I'm personally passionate about and just getting people inspired and, and helping them rally around a cause. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's evident in Swan Bitcoin, the team you've amassed is sort of a, uh feels like it's just naturally come together. Jan wrote Inventing Bitcoin. And that's a book that my wife and I read aloud to each other on a roof one day and really helped her understand Bitcoin. It's actually funny. There's nice. like a Chicago theme throughout all of this. He's in Chicago. He worked for Reaver or was a CTO of Reverb, which is like a guitar focused yeah. company. And I, I know that website alone because my roommate in college like desperately wanted to work for them. He's like a graphic designer and like he he would always talk oh dude my dream job would be like working at reverb designing their sites we have a bunch of friends in common randomly just people keep on coming out of the woodwork um it, it's really funny how many people we had in common on facebook and you know like there was this guy that used to run you know vip for one of the nightclubs and he ended up a few years later after we left chicago he ended up working for reverb and, and doing some bd for them and he hit me up and he was like oh my god i used to work for Jan." <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah so how did you two get connected like what is what is the story of of swan Bitcoin oh i hunted him year? i hunted him i hunted him like a beast yeah no i i just i loved the book i uh i went to bitcoin 2019 and uh asked him to sign it and we were already kind of chatting i i had uh, started the company um, just literally earlier that month, officially started the company, I think June 5th of, of 2019. Had the idea for Give Bitcoin, the first product that we put out um, in April of last year, and uh, was just building an advisory board of people that were really good Bitcoin educators, because I figured that's what we needed to be doing to get people to want to do that. The Give Bitcoin product is basically, you know, 
give somebody a little bit of Bitcoin so they start watching the price and you know feel like they have a little skin in the game. But you escrow it for a year, you lock it up with a custodian so they can't touch it, can't trade it for Ripple, whatever. Obviously, they can buy more, and you know this isn't going to be their whole stack. Hopefully, if you're doing a good job, and then over that year. Uh, we're educating them. So every month, you know, sending them a new chapter of The Gift of Bitcoin, which is the book that Matt is about two thirds of the way done writing. Uh, he actually uh, interviewed Matt Odell, I think this morning um, for the privacy chapter, which is chapter eight or nine. Hell yeah. And that's, I mean, that's one thing I think is important. That's why I started this podcast. The newsletter is, I, I just thought there was a, an incredible lack of quality uh education outside of technical resources when i started the newsletter it was all bitcoin talk uh andre's antonopoulos book um and everything was very very technically driven and trying to make it more make bitcoin more digestible to to the masses is something that i i i thought was necessary when starting this so it's like when i see companies like swan bitcoin that put an education first um sort of mindset into their product i'm always very happy because this is crazy. It's like it's an alien technology, and there's so much misinformation around it. And trying to get people quality information is so important. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you hit on it, right? I think education is the best marketing for Bitcoin because you know, especially for our product, you know, one's propensity to buy Bitcoin is directly correlated to their understanding and knowledge of Bitcoin. So if you know more, you buy more, which is great for us. So we don't even have a head of marketing. Um, you know, Brady Swenson, Citizen Bitcoin podcast host, he's our head of education. Um, and his job is to put out tons of educational content all the time. I love that. Head of education. Is that the first head of education at a company? At least I've heard of. Brady's doing, I don't know. Brady's doing great things. He's, yeah, if you freaks haven't heard his podcast yet, definitely go check out Citizen Bitcoin. And so, um, how, yeah, so how did you guys all like, your your core team come together outside of Jan. You you chase down Jan, and how did the products? Chase down Jan uh, Brady. I reached out to because I just really liked his podcast and the vibe, and I, I realized he didn't have a sponsor. And so I think in October I asked him if uh, we could be his first sponsor. Uh, and then, you know, we got to know each other a little bit, and in December when things started to heat up, and we realized that we were going to. A lot of people don't realize this, but we actually had recurring purchases for yourself as a feature inside of Give Bitcoin up until like mid-December when we decided to strip it out and rebuild it and make it its own product. Um, but I, once we knew we were going to do that and we knew we needed more bandwidth, we realized like, okay, the opportunity is huge here. We've got to go hard at this. Uh, I asked Brady if he would come and, and work on it with us. What was what drove the decision to sort of re-architect the the product at that given point in time? Are just getting feedback and it was really just to split it out. So give Bitcoin.io. You know, there's people you know got probably like twenty or thirty gifts a day going on there still, and you know people use it, people love it. It's still a good way to try to red pill people that are just not going to give it the time of day otherwise. Um, but obviously, like you know, type one spending, spending money on yourself is a bigger market, and, and that's that's Swan. This is just saying like, hey this is the place to set up your, your auto stacking. And, uh, you know, this is the place that you should tell other people to set up their auto stacking because it's hundred percent Bitcoin focused. There's no distractions. There's no altcoins like you're going to find on Coinbase and Gemini. Um, you know, and obviously we're all huge fans of, of Jack and cash app. And I've been friends with Steve Lee for a couple of years and love what he's doing with square crypto and everything. And miles has been supportive of us on the, on the cash app side. But, um, you know, I think we just, we offer, uh, a different offering and uh i think it's it's nice to have a place where you know it's going to be 100 percent bitcoin focused and all about bitcoin education and we're just frankly able to offer significantly lower fees than anybody else for what we do yeah so how does that work how are you how are you guys able to get lower fees is it yeah basically it's just you know small team not a public company not trying to squeeze profit out and uh you know, it's just a decision that we've made to be slightly less profitable than maybe we otherwise could be on a per user basis. Um, you know, we just, it's, it's a fairly simple product. We try to make sure that anytime we get, you know, two or three support requests that are taking up our time trying to answer a question, we build that into the product so that we don't get those support requests anymore. And we just, you know, Jan always talks about having a, a very narrow surface area for your product. So there's sort of only one way to use it. And, 
you know, probably the most regular feedback we get is like, did I just sign up? Because it's just so fast and so easy to do it. And it's just this one time decision that you make. And now you're, you know, building up a position in Bitcoin in the same way that you would, you know, a 401k just automatically taking money out of your paycheck or, you know, making that one time decision to buy a house. And that's how you end up accumulating equity, you know, in a mortgage. We wanted Bitcoin to be that, that third pillar of savings for Americans who are notoriously terrible at savings unless it's done automatically. Can they sell, can people sell via Swan? No, no sells one way only. only. And then how, so how does the mechanics of it work when you go and you set up a DCA, um, I noticed due to the ACH 60 day waiting period, you guys are holding the Bitcoin. Mm, it's, it's, it's 10 to 15 15 days actually. Yeah. 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 10 to 15 days. So basically you sign up and, and so we, we make a very strong distinction, um, about automating three key things, automatic pull from the bank account, automatic purchase of the Bitcoin and automatic withdrawal to your self custody. And we think that the user problem is not solved unless you have all three of those things. Um, So there is a little bit of a distinction there with DCA because a lot of people can claim that they have DCA. um, But, you know, most companies around the world that have DCA are actually saying, hey, wire us a bunch of money and we'll dole it out into Bitcoin over time. That doesn't really solve the problem of automated savings. So you really do need to have that, you know, we think, and our users seem to think that you really do need to have that automatic pull from the bank account as the first step. And we call it auto stacking. We're trying to make that a thing. <laughs> so it's broken up into two parts. The, well, the third of which is sending the Bitcoin to cust- your self custody. So you pull, which is recommended, but optional. Yeah. You don't have to, you can leave it with our custodian for free if you want to. So the first part is you pull the money out of the bank account and that just sits in like a fiat deposit on your platform. Mm-hmm. And then that's right. You buy Bitcoin for them when they want a DCA or it'd be the first of the month, 15th, whatever it may be. We're actually just almost everybody is on weekly. Um, so we're actually going to shut down. I think we already took the paycheck option out of the interface cause nobody was using it. And it's just annoying. Um, so we just have weekly and monthly and we're going to add daily. Nice. Um, yeah. So basically that, basically what happens is, you know, so you, you send your first deposit or the, or the first pull from the bank account happens and you have that 10 to 15 day wait. And then after that, it's just constant. It's always a pull. And, and, you know, someday, you know, two, three, 10 years ago or, or from now, when you turn it off, you'll have a couple more purchases after you stopped having pulls from your bank account. Okay. And, and how do you guys work? Like, how do you guys source the Bitcoin? OTC desks and major exchanges. So our prices just kind of mirror what you would see on Kraken or Coinbase Pro. Okay. And then is there, so there, we, we do not take a spread. So the only fees we take are the ones that you see. It's interesting. Different product, right? Um, and I've seen it <laughs> to date, right? Cause it's like the set it and forget it where, um, like, cause you, there's no like compulse compulsory stacks. You can't be like, ah, you can't wake up, take a piss. And be like, ah, I want to buy right now. Um, but you're trying to like remodel this, this, listen, one. man, we like to smash. We do like to smash by as well. <laughs> uh, you know, but it does happen. It's not like people don't have their exchange accounts anymore. And like, you can scratch that itch. What's nice to know is like, you know, if you're on vacation or like one of our one of our favorite customers who does YouTube videos about us constantly is a merchant Marine and like he's out to sea and he just loves to be auto stacking. We've, we've been using the hashtag swan and chill a lot. And we just have like pictures of people relaxing and it's like, you know, you're sitting on a giant swan floaty in a pool and it's like, she's, yep. She's stacking right now. Pause. No. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at is no. like, what, it, how does the, uh, the user interaction or the, the, the psyche around interacting with swan as opposed to an exchange, um, does it create more, uh, peace of mind? Is it a, a more relaxed stacker? Is there, it is, it's much more, it's all about Zen and cool. And we, you know, we, we're quite a meme factory cause we have uh, Breck Yvonne Bitcoin as our creative director and he does love to make memes. Um, so yeah, we, we, you know, shovel out a lot of images of like Paul Newman and Humphrey Bogart and just people kind of chilling and being cool and Zen and, you know, the dude, the dude should have stacked a lot, like definitely should have been stacking while he drank his white Russians. 
So what uh, what's the plan now? Like you guys are launched. It seems like you're getting your foot under your yeah. footing under you. How? Um... Yeah. So it's it's been we launched March thirtieth. It's uh, it's going exceptionally well so far, beating our expectations so far by about eight x, which is nice. So we're about two x ahead on users, and the average amount that people are buying is about four x what I had been modeling. So that's pretty cool. Um, and so, yeah, we, we launched, uh, we took the automated withdrawals live last week. So about 10 days ago, and people were, we just did that quietly because we always promised that was going to be in there. So it was nice to just have it show up. Um, but people are realizing that that's there and available. Um, we just launched a referrals program. So this is, even though we are us only for, uh, customers, our referrals program is open to people globally. So if you know, Wizard of Oz or, you know, somebody <laughs> overseas in Indonesia or whatever wants to target U.S. users on Twitter or, you know, on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever and try to get them to start stacking sats with Swan, you can just sign up at uh, swanbitcoin.com slash enlist, E-N-L-I-S-T, and, and just join the Swan force and start shoving Bitcoin at, at people in the U.S. So we'll get the whole, whole world to market Bitcoin to U.S. users. Um, and then we are, so we also just hired a new, uh, head of institutional, um, to tackle a couple of new initiatives. So Andy Edstrom, who wrote, uh, why buy Bitcoin, uh, and is also a partner in Westcap, which is a big wealth management firm in SoCal, former Goldman guy. Um, he's our head of institutional now, and he and I are working on the Swan IRA. So we really hate the, uh, if you look at the front load fees plus the back end fees at Bitcoin IRA, it's 11.25 11 11 plus three plus, you know, 1% per year or something. So it's just egregiously soaking their customers. We're going to do a Swan IRA that undercuts that by like 80 or 90%. Um, so still working on the numbers there, but we'll have a Swan IRA soon. The IRA. The IRA is always, what's the benefit of the IRA? You get like tax, it's tax beneficial in the long run, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just tax benefit. I mean, some people do want to do that. And remember, a lot of people are going to be rolling over as well. So, um, you know, they may have a 401k from some company they used to work at and they want to roll that over into a, a Roth or a traditional IRA and they want, you know, either some or all of that to be in Bitcoin and we'll make that easy for them to do. Yeah. And then for the auto withdrawals, are you allowed to dump an XPUB key or get the static address xpub is xpub is coming so yeah right now you can enter as many static addresses as you want and you can rotate them through um you know every week or every month or whatever um i think it's pretty soon so i'm not going to hang yawn out to dry here but it's we're not far away from making uh, xpub go live interesting um yeah no it's 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 been fun to see uh see everything come together uh, in the last few months, I mean, the, the design of the website yeah. is very sleek and, um, it's, uh, it's, I mean, the more on ramps to Bitcoin, the better. And it's funny that not funny. It's interesting. I, I think you guys are the first outside of like gift cards, maybe, um, uh, on only ramp, uh, that I've, I've encountered. Is there anybody else doing that where you can't sell? Uh, not in the U S I think that's probably Amber in Australia. I think Alex Svetsky's one way only, I think. Um, and I think Bitter was one way only. Rest in peace. So they recently shut down. Yeah. Ruben, he's a soldier. Um, so yeah, I think it's just us. You know, I mean, my view is like, this is either the best or the second best consumer product of the internet age. It's, you know, maybe a toss up today between Bitcoin and search. And it's the only one that you can basically sell directly to consumers. That's not in, you know, not an enterprise product actually. So it's probably the best consumer product of the internet age. It has the widest audience and the most people that should be buying it. And so it's hilarious to me that there aren't already like a few thousand businesses just selling Bitcoin. Best, best app of the consumer age. Why do you dive into that? What are, I said, it's just, it's just the best consumer product. Yeah. I mean, you're literally selling, good you can use bad money to buy good money like that's the best product ever <laughs> yeah so let's dive into that a little bit like why why bitcoin for you personally <clears throat> what um like having been through the tech bubble and the private equity bubble i like, is that sort of what drove you towards bitcoin as a monetary system or as a free and open software in the digital age
very clear now that you know the the big problem with the dot com bust and the global financial crisis and what we're going through right now, which is GFC two or Great Great Depression two. We'll see what it is. You know, it's all because of the crappy money and just how unfair that is. And I've certainly felt you know the effect of the treadmill over the course of my life. Um, you know, just like it seems very difficult to to get ahead when your money is crappy and the culture is constantly coming at you telling you to consume. And, you know, we've been fed these, these narratives that are all around consumption. And even when you think that you've broken out of the narrative and you think like, Oh, I'm not going to go buy the McMansion in the car because I'm liberated. And instead I'm going to be one of these people that goes and, you know, consumes travel and experiences and then later you realize that that was actually just, you know, companies and the system kind of marketing that to you as well. And so there's a whole generation of people now waking up and saying like, oh shit, I have no money. And I also have no car in house. I've got all these experiences, but those were all actually like McMansion visits to Paris and Barcelona. And I was just next to everybody else going to tourist bars. And, you know, it was all just sort of like productized for me. So there's only like, you know, 0.1% of people that are actually doing something that wasn't scripted for them it's like Anne Hathaway finding out like her Kmart sweater and Devil Wears Prada was you know actually chosen for her specifically by somebody in Paris you know a year before and they knew she was going to buy it and she was like <gasps> <laughs> no you get into a very interesting point I mean that's somebody who's in his late 20s now I guess it's like something my generation is definitely um, force-fed go travel the world, get all these experience, a bit hedonistic yeah. in some, some ways, very, uh, very, uh, very, um, I don't want to say selfish, but, uh, self absorbed uh, is probably the better term there. And, yeah. and it is weird. Wake, like some people are waking up in their mid thirties. Like what the hell's going on in my life? And I don't have a, sig- a significant other. I don't have kids. What is this all about? So there's a, uh... I'll give an example. So there's this place called uh, Malibu Cafe, which is actually in the mountains above Malibu, not too far from here. And I didn't know about it, but evidently it's been there for like 20 years or something. And when the fires rolled through here a year and a half ago, they kind of redid it. And so uh, a friend, you know, and his family dragged us out there and we went and I'm looking around, I'm like, man, this place is like paradise. This is just so beautiful. I can't believe this place is here. And like, it has Wi-Fi, and you could actually just come here on a weekday and hang out all day. And it's outdoors and indoors and good food and drink. Like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then I look around and I realize the entire place is actually a collection of sets for Instagram photos. And everyone that's there is like basically a wannabe influencer or somebody, everyone has their phones out the entire day and they're just going basically from like set to set taking these you know, pictures for Instagram. And I just started to feel really dirty. Yeah, man. It is weird. The whole influencer economy, like we're seeing it now with TikTok. Like I sent a tweet out last night. TikTok is a cursed app. It's making people do weird things and uh, very, very little value add to, to these activities. When, you, when you're talking about the, the net benefit to society overall, maybe I'm just some grumpy asshole who's judging people. But uh, I think... There is some weird, uh, weird social things going on right now where people, people's priorities are all out of whack. It's the dopamine for the like, the retweet, which I'm guilty of. I've said that plenty of times on this podcast. I certainly get guilty of it on Twitter, but um, when it comes to like the influencer economy and, and like just wanting your life to look better than it actually is to virtue signal to people you don't even like at the end of the day or, or, or no is, is very, very weird. And again, like going back to like hedonism, we are at this weird part of, of humanity is weird time in humanity where it's, it seems very, again, self-absorbed and is the pendulum going to swing back towards a more communal type of uh, society, um, a values family and, and looking after your neighbors instead of, instead of pumping yourself on these apps I don't see a swing back for broad society. I think it'll just keep on going down the scary path, but I do think that more and more people will just kind of like opt out however they can and, you know, put the phone down and not have those apps and and things like that. So I think you'll see just sort of like a broad move toward, you know, modern day asceticism or something. Yeah. We do need to bring back better aesthetics. 
where I am right now has got terrible aesthetics. It's all plastic houses that all look the same. I, I was actually using like aesthetic as in a, as in a monk, but oh, uh, yeah, oh. aesthetics too. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's another interesting thing like with the, all the tracking that goes on on these phones and these, uh, this tech that we have, like, are people going to start putting down their phones? Like JW Weatherman came on and said, he's going to start leaving his phone at home when he goes out. Like is the, dr- <laughs> is the drive for the surveillance economy by the government going to force people to sort of try to unplug just to, to stay away from, from the Orwellian overwatch. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be, uh, it'll be interesting. I mean, just the, uh, you know, trying to balance time with your family and time with work when you know that your work and your engagement with the, you know, the Bitcoin community globally is just so accessible right there in your phone. And we have like support chat on my phone and I have Twitter on my phone and I have Slack on my phone to, you know, work with the team and all these things. And it's like, yeah, if you want to be a good dad to a five-year-old and a two-year-old and like a, a stand-up husband, you know, you need to really block off some, some quality time where you leave the phone in a different room. Yeah. How, yeah, how do you manage all that? Running a company, having having young children, and trying to trying to balance that act. You you might get different answers from the two adults in the home. Uh, Mrs. Swan probably thinks I'm falling a little bit short, but um, I mean broadly, like my setup is uh, I take them in the morning, so I'm kind of like with the kids from the time they wake up at like six or six thirty. Uh, until my wife kind of gets up and about around like nine, nine thirty. So I'm kind of like on my phone and with the kids for like, and this is, this is a, you know, COVID contemporary with not taking them to school. This is just kind of how it's been working for the last couple months and, and will be working for the next three or so at least. Um, and so I have kind of that three hour block where I'm kind of working and engaging and doing Twitter and setting agendas for the day and, and kind of just thinking while also managing the kids. And then I have kind of like an unbroken block of work from call it like 9.30 until about 4.30, something like that. So I get to get like a good solid seven hours. And then it's kind of like, you kind of start getting pulled into some house things. And it's kind of, again, another three hours from like four to seven where it's bouncing back and forth between work and family. And then really like 6.30 to 8.30 when I can get the second, I, I put the, both girls to bed as well. So um, usually. So that's kind of like phone is away for those two hours. So there's two hours each day where I'm like just with the kids. And then also when we, uh, you know, my wife and I not only auto stack Swan and chill, we also Netflix and chill uh, late at night. And I leave my phone in a different room for our, you know, hour and a half, two hours of just kind of like hanging and talking. And she's gotten really good at making cocktails. Uh, She already was pretty good, but it's off the charts now. What uh, what are your go-to cocktails these days? Uh, she just bought a ton of fresh mint. So she's been making a lot of mojitos. Um, she also, I'm usually tired at night. So she tries to like jack me up on caffeine so I can hang longer and, you know, watch another show or, or talk some more. So she'll make a a pretty incredible espresso martini. So she likes to jack me up with that late night, which is funny. Um, but otherwise I think you already know I'm a, I'm a huge fan of just like scotch neat. I love scotch. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of espresso martinis too. It's like espresso yeah. martini season down here as well. Um, yeah. No, it's one thing. Uh, I'm plugging in the quality time. It's very similar schedules. I have uh, most days when I, when I don't have to, to get up and do something early. If I have like a lot of calls, I try to get to bend out earlier, but yeah, waking up at five thirty and chilling, chilling with my son until like eight thirty nine. Nice. And then, um, yeah, the bust an ass until like five thirty. Sometimes later than that, and he goes to bed around eight. So it's very similar. Um, yeah, but it is weird with this new. No- uh, I just said it new normal. I don't like to say no new normal because I think things will get back to. I'm. I don't. I think things will get back to what normal, whatever normal is, what things were at some point. Um, I'm not as. I'm not as worried about everybody being. Uh, being stationed in our pods for the rest of eternity. But, um, it was an easy transition for me cause I already worked from home and the only, the only hiccup this is thrown at me is I mainly used to record these episodes in person with people. And that's the only sort of transition I've had to make, but you guys are completely distributed, right? So you never had an office. You, you've been building this product, um, remotely with each other. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. We've got, uh, let's see, we've got Chicago, Lawrence, Kansas, 
some small town outside of Frankfurt, uh, Hawaii, New York City, Brooklyn, right by you, actually. That's where Matt lives, Ruby. Uh, and then only uh, Andy and I are here in LA area, but we never see each other in person anyway. Hawaii. <laughs> Who's in Hawaii? Uh, one of our meme warriors that does a lot of like social media stuff for us, Robbie. Yeah. Oh, and I should mention, and Guy Swan. So Guy is uh, actually doing all of our like PR media outreach and, and like pitching, you know, Jan and Andy and me and, and Brady and, and himself and Brecky for, you know, podcasts and articles and stuff like that. So he's, he's uh, learning the PR trade and, and approaching people as a peer. Like I also am in media and it's, uh, it's starting to pay off. He's booking a lot of appearances for us, which is awesome. Bitcoin Audible. Yeah, man. Best pivot I've seen in this space. From crypto yes. economy. Yes. Um, Great new title. I love it. Yeah. So what are you uh what are you most looking forward to in the Bitcoin world? Like outside of what you guys are doing at Swan. What uh what are you paying attention to? Um obviously you got uh Bitcoiner Bit Bitcoiner Ventures as well. What uh what's what's the whole ethos behind that and, and yeah. why are you guys doing that? So Bitcoin or ventures is, is uh, the actualization of an idea I had in like summer of 18. So I, I basically, you know, I got into Bitcoin proper in spring of 17, started going down the rabbit hole, did the shitcoin horseshoe for about 10 months, became a maximalist by like March or April of 18. Um, and so that summer I was looking at it and, you know, I, I come from startups and raising money and stuff like that. And I was looking at Bitcoin startups and it was looked like, okay, these tokens and ICO projects have no problem raising money because they're creating money out of thin air and people are dumb enough to believe that. But these Bitcoin startups face this incredible difficulty of if you don't understand Bitcoin or care about it, you're not going to invest in Bitcoin startup. If you do understand and care about Bitcoin, then you're most likely just going to want to own as much Bitcoin as possible and not really going to allocate much <laughs> spare change to just about anything else. And so from the beginning, my thought was, okay, you would probably need a very large LP base, uh, you know, base of limited partners. You need a lot of people to have like a Bitcoin ecosystem fund. So I started a little telegram group with like Dan Held, Steve Lee, and a few other people trying to noodle on like what this could become. And that dates way back to summer of 18. And I kind of shelved it, um, you know, through, through the winter and just kept on kind of like thinking about it in the background. And when I had the idea for Give Bitcoin, which evolved into Swan, and we started to meet a lot of people, I started to realize, okay, like we seem to be pretty good at finding hand raisers from around the world that want to invest in Swan. Like they just hit us up on Twitter, or ping us on LinkedIn, or find some way to get introduced to us and say like, hey, do you guys need money? And I know that's partially because we're super easy to understand and we're also very public and very noisy, but it got me thinking, okay, now on the backs of this is probably the time to start, uh, you know, what, what we decided to call Bitcoin or ventures. So it evolved out of the original idea. And then, you know, Marty, you, you and I both know the, uh, the Bitcoiners telegram group is a good group of people and it's pretty, you know, pretty heavy hitting and been able to, you know, source some good ideas and have good Intel. And we have people that we can ask about different technologies and, and different companies and kind of surface ideas there. Now we have a Bitcoin or Ventures community group that is constantly sort of pitching us ideas. And you know, this will be things like what you're working on, like Great American Mining or Stephen Barber, you know, Upstream Data or, you know, the Lollies and the Folds and the Unchains and the Casas and the Lightning Labs and, you know, Satoshi Energy and Zap Wallet, Swan, things like that. So these are the types of companies that we want to fund over time. And uh, so we decided to hang up a shingle and actually create the thing. So the partners are myself, Jan Pritzker, who's been a longtime angel in addition to uh, operating startups. And then Stefan Levera um, from the Stefan Levera podcast and Louis Liu, who's uh, becoming a little bit better known. He was, uh, he has a family office that he invests out of, invests his own money in a, in a few different startups, including Unchained and us and um, really is into lightning guys constantly sending me lightning stuff. And then um, also was working at block tower as a junior investor for Ari Paul, uh, and in that seat, after looking at all of the other options out there, he accidentally became a maximalist while he was in that seat. And so he recently left Block Tower and is working on Bitcoin or Ventures. Uh, um, yeah. That's, uh, that's usually what happens. You see, yeah. you see all the shit out it, there. It, 
it does happen. It does happen a lot. It's funny how many people at uh, at Galaxy are like full on maximalists now. Uh, we just we just got another junior person from Galaxy to invest in Swan, and it's like not that surprising if you spend this much time in the space and you have half a brain. At some point, other than just making money, you usually end up becoming a maximalist. It seems like. Well, and this it's into an interesting topic we can dive down to is like, is it more profitable in the long run? Like, do you see it being more profitable for you at Swan? And then I do want to loop back on Bitcoin or ventures, talk mm-hmm. about like um, investing in Bitcoin companies versus just investing in Bitcoin directly, but focusing on Bitcoin only companies right now, like it's like you saw Coinbase added Omai's Go to their token suite today, and they couldn't. They last week they they crashed when the price got a little volatile, um, and so that sort of un that lack of focus that Coinbase uh, seems to at least uh, to me to be uh, displaying to the rest of the market. I think that's going to hurt them in the long run. Is this? I won't ask any leading questions here, but is this part of the decision that went in? To being Bitcoin only because you can Binance is very profitable selling shit coins and, and reaping the fees from that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I would never do either of those businesses for the same reason that I wouldn't get into, you know, selling cigarettes or, you know, trying to sell Oxycontin through side channels and, you know, try to get our doctors to, you know, push that on people that didn't really need it. You know, those are all similar businesses to me. Um, so I think uh, we saw that the opportunity was wide open and it wasn't clear until we kind of got in a bit how wide open the opportunity was just to sell only Bitcoin. But if you go on Coinbase's homepage, I think it's the number 13 or number 14 call to action as you scroll from the top and keep going down to just basically do what you ought to be doing with Bitcoin, which is just buying some regularly. Like it's, it's totally buried. Um, you know, and you've got the, the Winklevia always tweeting crypto things and things that are bad for you. And Bitcoin IRA is like putting out charts, talking about $589 ripple and sending that to your grandma. It's like, there's so many bad really? actors in the space. Yeah. They actually sent an email, you know, basically presenting one of those Twitter charts about like why ripple can get to 589. And they sent that to people that put their money in IRAs. That's like a, um, five trillion dollar market cap for ripple right or i have no idea i don't know oh, just horrible people I'm a six. um but yeah i mean getting back to coinbase yeah i mean it's, i think they've just left this thing wide open because they're trying to juice revenue everywhere and trying to squeeze money out of everybody all over the place they want you to trade that same you know thousand dollars 50 times not just put it into bitcoin and let it sit there because um, they make fees on the in and the out every single time and you know i i they know that the support costs for a customer that's just buying Bitcoin isn't worth it to them. And that's why they charge 9.9% for the smallest buys. You know, we're going the opposite direction. You know, we launched with, I think, uh, so our lowest fee is like 0.99%. And that's as long as you're doing 50 bucks a week or more and you prepay your fees annually, it's 0.99%, 1.19% if you're doing pay as you go. So just like set up your plan and you're just like paying your fees as you go. It's 1.19%. Our, our smallest, you know, the, the minnow tier, people that are doing like $5 a month or $10 a week or something, we are actually lowering that fee. So our new fees there are uh, 2.29% for pay as you go and 1.99%. So just under 2% for, uh, for prepaid fees on the very smallest buys versus Coinbase and Gemini being at like 9.9%. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's what like, I got. I, that's how I got introduced to Bitcoin was Coinbase where I bought a lot of my sats early in, in the, my journey. It's just like such a shame to see them fuck up this opportunity and, and again, mislead their users. Like, Oh, my go. They added that today. Like, why would you add that? Isn't that like a dead project? Um, and it really, it is. And it's, I mean, that you even, that you even know that it is or isn't actually kind of scares me. I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I just, because I remember during the 2017, like, ICO craze, and I was covering it for the bent. I was, like, one of the huge ones that pumped, and mm-hmm. it was all hump and no red rocket. Nothing ever came of it. And, Man. Um, and that's why, like, trying to call out scammers in the space, like Vitalik, like, personally endorsed that and advised it. And, um, 
it's uh, uh, it's interesting to see how much people are getting away with. But again, it's capitalism. The uh, the opportunity uh, for individuals to make their own mistakes is should definitely persist. But uh, and that's what I'm so f- in, uh, so happy about in the last two years, particularly, is that Bitcoin only companies are coming to market, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if we head into another bull run, uh, who, who ends up surviving or at least being more popular on the other. Yeah. End. Yeah. I mean, and, and tying that back into Bitcoin adventures, like, so I, I do believe that, uh, some of this current cohort of Bitcoin only companies will far outperform the Bitcoin price. Um, I would not say that a basket of them will. But someday, I don't know if it's at the end of the next cycle. So like if we're talking again in, you know, 2025 or 2026 or something like that. And, you know, there's a new cohort of Bitcoin only startups that started in 2023, 24 or whatever. You know, there will be a time and we just want to be ready for it with the infrastructure there where I actually think like a basket of, of good Bitcoin startups that will actually be really smart to own those because it'll be a little bit more about adoption and services and lightning and payments and all of these other things. So for me, like I'm going to be in Bitcoin for the rest of my career, you know, getting started today and and building out that infrastructure and finding the hand raisers around the world um, who are, you know, interested at least in learning about Bitcoin startups and occasionally writing checks you know, whatever their calculation is on risk reward, they may make a judgment. You know, I personally have made the judgment that, you know, I personally think that, you know, Swan's going to outperform Bitcoin. You know, I think our equities can outperform the Bitcoin price over the, over the lifetime of this company, or I wouldn't be doing it. I'd just go work corporate and, you know, stack sats with the excess. I'm taking a startup salary instead of working at Google and McKinsey. Like, obviously I believe in this thing. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> I do, uh, I do think that we're probably like a cycle or two away from like a basket of Bitcoin only startups outperforming Bitcoin on price. I think Bitcoin has a lot of legs left. It certainly does. It's a bold, bold, bold statement. Outperform Bitcoin performance. Outperform the corn. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, BitMEX did 2200X in four years on their equity since their seed round and Coinbase was like, you know, even after it was already pretty large and they had like a a really high priced A round and they did another like 16 or 20X in the next three or four years. Like it's not unreasonable for some of these businesses to grow. And especially if you're talking about getting into the seed round, which is our focus, that's our entry, that's our desired entry point for Bitcoin Adventures is kind of like sub 20 million. There's a lot of upside for these companies potentially. Yeah. So how's that? Does it work similar to bank for the future, but like without the shit coin and without all that, like you're just looking to get in, you're looking to get in early. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so we probably will eventually have a committed capital fund and just operate like a normal VC, but for now it's uh angelist syndicates. So you go and you, you know, sign up for angelist and subscribe to the syndicate and then you have the right, but not the obligation to invest in our deals. So just go to bitcoinerventures.com and, uh, and you can see the link to the Angela syndicate there, or you can just sign up and leave your email address and we'll let you know what's going on. But we are just about to close down our first deal, which uh, hopefully when Jan is on in a few weeks here, uh, he can announce that, but it's a well-loved, well-known Bitcoin company. And we're super proud that they're our first one and being able to contribute some money into their current round. Yeah. What's the, uh, what's the minimum check somebody has to write? Thousand fed bucks. <laughs> It's not bad at all. They're printing that every millisecond. Right. Yeah. And that's like, if it does outperform Bitcoin, if any of these companies that could be life changing for so many. So like that whole concept of letting retail, um, get into these rounds is very fascinating. Well, Angelist, remember, is accredited investors, so it's not everybody. Um, uh, so you, you self-certify, but you got to answer some questions and like Angelist has to certify you to be able to invest in deals. So okay. that's not, that's not crowdfunding. No. Okay. I didn't realize that. So you had to, you had to have more yeah. than 250,000 in assets or tradable assets at least. Whatever, whatever their rules are. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are looking at, uh, I've been talking to the Republic people as well about doing Republic raises, which is actually proper crowdfunding. Um, so they kind of spun out of AngelList. I think it's the AngelList CFO or something like that. Um, and they seem to have their, they have a, a pretty tight filter on who they actually work with and they have like a really professional team and 
they uh, they have reputable partners. They use the same custodian that we do, uh, Prime Trust. Um, so I'm feeling pretty comfortable with those guys. So maybe we will actually do some uh, some big global crowd fundings for some of these as well, where it makes sense. Like that could make sense for something like Swan, where it's you know it's a one sentence pitch. It's not particularly techy. It's easy to understand. So you know that that might be you know, or something that's, you know, kind of really well known because it's kind of like a household name or, or has a large user base. So something like a fold that has many tens of thousands of users or like a, like an unchanged that has, you know, so many people reading Parker's series, you know, I, I think those, those become more marketable. It'll be hard to do crowdfunding for something that's, uh, you know, a little bit more techy and arcane and, you know, doesn't have isn't particularly marketable to a broad base no you br- that bring us brings up an interesting point like the uh content market or to actually be successful at least in my opinion moving forward you have to get, be good at content and providing good content valuable content and parker certainly does it's gradually and suddenly obviously you have the head of education um on your uh, brady working on all this stuff to yep. to get it out there and guy educating people uh, with his content, which is and Brecky, Brecky is the general in the great Bitcoin meme wars of the 2020s. I mean, he is <laughs> he's we've got something coming out called the Arsenal, so it'll it'll be launching soon. It'll be at SwanBitcoin.com/arsenal, and basically are uh, are going to be a a lightly curated repository of every single thing that you could possibly want to uh, win the Bitcoin meme wars globally. Yeah, he's uh his blockchain and Morty series is incredible um, yeah yeah he, he'd probably like to forget the crypto brecky days we, we, we've got a lot of people that have uh, shed their skin and become all uh, 100 bitcoin over the last few years it's i mean it's hard to find somebody who went straight uh straight maximalist or just understood the value prop and it's and i mean again going back to the nature of these open systems it's it's easy to get distracted when there's so many shiny things running around and i think um, Brecky's doing a good job of, of spreading the good knowledge, particularly on Instagram. That's something I'm terrible at. That uh, that uh, yeah, he he will man. fight, and he'll he'll you know he'll befriend people and like steer the ship slowly. You know, he maintains relationships with a bunch of the crypto YouTubers, and he just tries to get them to like insert Bitcoin videos here. <laughs> it's uh, that's like yeah, it's another world. That's Matt was bringing that up. He's got friends diving into the space and they're going YouTube first and he's worried. He's like, Oh my God, what are you watching? And it's, it's like a whole other world of with an insane amount of people producing content that I don't even know about. Um, it's, it's the yeah. first way some people are getting exposed, which is, which is weird. Like how do we, how do we get like our content to be the first thing people come to? There's always something that's on my mind. I don't know. And I actually don't know how they keep their channels up because you know, ours got banned fairly quickly. Um, yeah. What happened there? Uh, Are you still well, banned? We, we, yeah, we're still banned. Um, so yeah, we got banned uh, as soon as we put up a placeholder video that had uh, Francis Puglio's name in it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Either that or I think the title had coronavirus. It's probably the coronavirus. But, uh, <laughs> but it was like, we're going to talk Bitcoin macro and like, you know, coronavirus with Francis and, uh, and Pierre. Uh, this was, you know, late March or something like that. And uh, they they took it down and banned our channel. And we have not been able to ap- appeal to get that back up. Um, so, yeah. So every week we put out Swan Signal Live, which is Wednesday mornings at 10 or 11 Pacific. And and uh, we always have two guests. It's kind of like a, a good cross-conversational format. We try to find interesting pairings of people that you might, you know, want to hear from both of them on a topic. And uh, And, yeah. We uh, we can't put it on YouTube on our Swan Bitcoin channel because the channel's gone. I'm surprised we haven't been banned yet. We talk a lot, we've talked a lot about coronavirus on this podcast, but I, don't, I think uh, we get away. Just because... Do you put this on YouTube? Uh, I mean, yeah, I have like a you just put an, the audio on it. Just put the audio on. I have some upload.fm, some 16 year old yeah. made app that allows you to automatically pull from your podcast RSS feed on the YouTube and just nice. put that up there the placeholder picture very low low budget um low, <laughs> low production but value but uh, it gets it to a different audience people want to listen on 
YouTube. Um, and that's like, I tried to do a live stream recently. Like my internet down where I am is not conducive for, for live streaming, mm -hmm. um, content. And it is, uh, YouTube is definitely a, a medium where there's a lot of sharks. Uh, and there's been, I've seen like a lot of trading group ads recently, which is discouraging. Um, and it'll be, and again, going back to where we are now, like, do you think the public beyond, um, beyond our little bubble on crypt or Bitcoin Twitter, excuse me, I'm going to say crypto Twitter, um, under like, is Bitcoin so much of a household name that, that people will naturally gravitate towards it and be able to avoid the scams going forward? Will the scams be as, as powerful as they were in the past? Something it won't be as powerful as they were in the past, or at least the percentages, the percentage of the people of new people getting caught up in them, I don't think will be as high as the last cycle, but it'll still be economically worth it for the scammers to do it because, you know, I think the, I think the overall number of people coming in in 2021 is going to be, you know, probably 10 X what it was in 2017. And so even if you're coming, even if you're capturing, let's, so let's say that they were capturing like, three quarters of the people initially in Bitcoin only was capturing like 25%. Like let's say all of the great work by you guys and Stefan and Brady and Safe's book and Jan's book and Newt's book and all these great, you know, educational resources and all the evangelizing and all the white blood cells that we've sort of built with UASF and taco plebs and all this like fight so hard. And like we double our effectiveness so that we actually stop half of the people, twice as many as last time from getting involved in shit coins. You know, the shit coins are still going to be up like five X. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> so I think there are going to be a lot of people getting wrecked this cycle too. And a lot of dumb people getting rich um, from scams. And uh, you know, but I think our, our pie, our market share is getting bigger. Yeah. No, I got a, I was made aware of a five coins to $5 million scam that's going around. It's not like a one coin or a bit connect. Uh, like I said, on rabbit hole recaps, I didn't understand what was going on. Apparently it's just some investor letter that people are buying. And it's, he's saying that, um, uh, crypto.com's coin and chin, uh, cosmos are all going to go to like a million dollars a coin. And at some point and he's pushing that on his, his newsletter leader readers freaks if you're buying trading advice or paying for somebody to tell you how to trade it's not the way to do it people are not going to give up their secrets if they have a market edge it's uh it's wishful thinking if it sounds too good to be true it probably is um it's been a fascinating conversation what uh where can we learn more about what you're doing or we're keeping up to keeping up to pace with what you're doing and yeah. yeah i mean so we we have a pretty uh active blog at swan signal i'm sorry it's well, swanbitcoin.com slash signal i think but you can just find the blog um jan has a bunch of stuff up there brady myself we have a lot of guest posts from people like bitcoin tina and guy and, and other folks um my 10 million 10 million bitcoiners the intransigent minority kind of tying in the whole like telebian to bitcoin thing and like my personal view that we need 10 million Bitcoiners in the U S to just sort of like make this thing really go. Um, so that's kind of the mission of the company. So that piece is up there. Um, we have a very active telegram group at t.me slash swan signal. So that's where we actually take uh, crowd questions and, and just sort of keep the discussion going all week long around the swan signal show. Um, swan Bitcoin on Twitter and uh, Corey Clipston on Twitter. Pretty easy to find me. 10 million Bitcoiners in the U S alone. You think we're close? What's the number uh, right now? No, not very close. I mean, the way that we're defining it is like having a meaningful amount of Bitcoin. So you have skin in the game and then, you know, basically understanding it and caring about it to the point where you would like write a letter to your local rep if you had to, or show up at a town hall meeting and, and yell at them for being the Gestapo. If they tried to do something anti Bitcoin, uh, I'm like, two miles away from the border of Brad Sherman's district. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So if, if uh, it ever, if it ever needs to, you know, maybe we'll just like move across the border and, and start showing up and raising some hell over there. Start voting against him. That dude is such an idiot. Yeah. He's pretty bad. 
Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, like- our, our estimation is that about, uh, about 7 million people globally have a hundred dollars or more worth of Bitcoin. And I think the number, you know, if you kind of like just do kind of, and this is all in, in, in the piece and I haven't looked at it in a little bit, but basically we kind of get to, we think there's about a hundred thousand people in the U S that both understand Bitcoin and own like something meaningful. And let's just say that's like 2,500 bucks worth or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, we basically think we need to like hundred X that to get to 10 million, which then gets you over the hump of the intransigent minority, which is usually like three to 4% of a population where somebody with, you know, really uh, strong views and intolerant minority can sort of flip society to doing things the way that they want them done because they're noisy about it, which is the, the same concept as like regulatory capture or kosher food everywhere, things like that. You know, you only need about three or four percent to really, really believe in something, and everybody follows. The founding fathers, so, yeah. Uh, they, they made up, I think, two to three percent of the, the colonial citizens. And they changed the world forever. They did indeed. Yeah, yeah. we uh, we very much believe in uh, in Bitcoin for America. So do, yeah, I mean, yeah. let's let's go make it happen. By yeah, the way, did you happening. see our Bitcoin for America video? I think you did. Yeah, right? yeah, with yeah. Obama. Yeah, he, he said he said sup freaks. Sup freaks. <laughs> that was that was Reggie Brown, who's been kind of the, the top uh, Obama person impersonator for the last twelve years or so. Another guy we know from uh, from Chicago days. And uh, yes, yeah, so we had him do a uh, like a Bitcoin speech, and he made a bunch of TFTC references. And so I love that sup freaks. <laughs> sup freaks. That was much appreciated. He's um, it was funny hearing. I would love to hear uh, the real Obama say something like that. Um, he did. Real well, Obama has we'll mentioned there. Bitcoin before. We'll get there. Swiss bank account in your pocket. He's got to be stacking, right, Barack? He's too smart not to be stacking. I'd imagine everybody in that in that class just, um, if you have that much <laughs> money, it doesn't make sense not to allocate at least a little bit. And who knows? Yeah. Maybe he's a, maybe he is a loyal to the empire and doesn't stack in a, in solidarity with with the. Uh, with the fiat monetary system who knows though it would be just just depressing but um yeah it's it is interesting to think about it i mean there's a uh i i I am aware that one of kushner's best friends socially is a big hodler and has been to the white house three times to talk about bitcoin over the years yeah matt matt says that donnie donnie stacks uh, stacks. somebody somebody in his he uh, he assumes that somebody in in Donald's circle is holding Bitcoin, probably nice. his sons. Well, I, I just checked the dashboard, by the way, and I was just thinking about Paul Tudor Jones, and I wanted to see. Uh, so our our best day for signups ever was the the day that Paul Tudor Jones came out saying that he uh, was was hodling. However, I don't care. Whatever for him, futures, spot, don't care. Cold storage, hot storage. Even if he has it on Coinbase, I don't care. Just the fact that he's buying it is awesome. Um, you know, everybody else will follow that and hopefully we'll teach them how to do it properly. But, uh, yeah, today on a Friday, we are, uh, we are one sign up away from, uh, our all time high. Hell yeah. Congrats, dude. You sure you're not streaming live? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> might not, we might be. I hope. Yeah. Not. This is, this is nuts. Usually we, we, I mean, we have, we close the books at 5 PM Pacific every day. So I have like five more hours to go. I think we're going to have our all time high today. Well, congrats on that. Keep Chuck keep chugging along keep spreading the good word keep educating i appreciate you coming by man i know uh i know i had to switch up the time today i'm sorry for throwing that on you um but yeah keep crushing it man yeah working hard man we're just uh trying to trying to do what we can to bring about a bright orange future yeah every little bit helps yeah well we're gonna keep pushing alongside you and um yeah that's all we got this week freaks peace and love